Hi everyone, Dr. Anne Sylvestre here. I am a board certified veterinary surgeon and I'm going to talk to you about laryngeal paralysis today. With the warm months now upon us in Canada and the northern United States, this is a problem that we're going to see a little bit more of. Laryngeal paralysis is a disease of larger breed geriatric dogs. So think Labradors, Golden Retrievers, Mastiffs, Newfoundlands. Because laryngeal paralysis is a progressive condition, it's a progressive paralysis, even though the patient may present in an acute collapse type of state because of a respiratory distress episode, you need to dig into the history. So we're going to get progression of exercise intolerance because they have uh, more difficulty breathing. So the owners might report more raspiness to the breath when the dog is excited or when the dog exercises a little bit more. And intolerance to heat, they may spew and sputter and cough a little bit after drinking and eating, especially drinking. But most importantly, and you often need to ask the question is that the dog will have a voice change. The bark will change. It may be a little bit squeakier, but often it becomes a little bit more harsh, more of a <laughs> kind of bark. But there is always a bark change associated with laryngeal paralysis. For me, the diagnosis of laryngeal paralysis is based on history and clinical presentation, um, and then confirmed by having a look at the larynx under light plane of anesthesia to see whether it is moving appropriately or not. To the referring veterinarians that are listening to this, you do not need to confirm a diagnosis of laryngeal paralysis before sending the pet because we're going to repeat that test anyways. It's done just before going to surgery. So it's not like a two-step process where we'll confirm the diagnosis one day and go to surgery the next. And it's a, it's a test that's incredibly difficult to do. It's got a lot of false positives associated with it because you're trying to prove that the larynx does not work. Yet, under general anesthesia, the larynx doesn't work. So it's, it's a fine balance, it's a fine uh, detail to be able to confirm a diagnosis of laryngeal paralysis. The best treatment option for laryngeal paralysis, the best surgical option for laryngeal paralysis is the arretinoid lateralization procedure also known as the tie back. It is a technically challenging procedure and not one that you're gonna to wanna to read a textbook and go out and do it. So this is the type of case that you are definitely gonna to wanna to refer to a board certified surgeon, somebody with experience with this surgery because that's where the better prognosis will come. I'm going to explain to you how the surgery works um, how the larynx works, I'm going to do it in lay terms. I know this channel is meant for veterinarians, but I suspect that there may be a few pet owners that have just received this diagnosis and they can understand it better if I use lay terms. Also, I think it might help if you're having difficulties figuring out how to explain this to a pet owner. Maybe the way I'm explaining it will help you help somebody else. Let's get rid of that fly. So here we go. The larynx or the voice box is the gateway, the opening to the trachea or the windpipe. And the job of the larynx is to act as a gateway. It is to close down when the animal swallows and it's to open up as the animal breathes in. And the more air the animal needs, so if he's running, the more it's going to open up. Now, unfortunately, with laryngeal paralysis, what happens is that the gates to the windpipe, they're just, they're frozen. They don't work anymore. They're like this all the time. So when the animal swallows, the gates don't close. When the animal needs more air to go running, the gates don't open. 
What we do at surgery is we take one of the gates and we prop it open. This is the challenge because if we open it too much, food and water may go down there. If we don't open it enough, we haven't made a big difference to this dog's condition. Therefore, we need to open it enough. This is where the experience comes in. Now understand that all we're doing is anchoring the gate open. We're actually not fixing anything. So the dog still cannot take a big intake of air when he needs to. Therefore, even though the dog will be able to do more after surgery, they're probably not gonna go doing a fly ball competition, all right? There's still gonna be limitations and they have the potential for taking in food or water down their windpipe and therefore being prone to pneumonia. In the hands of a trained surgeon, surgery carries a very good prognosis. The complications, the potential complications after surgery are, there are two main ones, two big ones you've got to think about. Pneumonia and breakdown of the surgical repair. I'm gonna talk about pneumonia first, because to me that is the biggest one. When thinking of the potential for pneumonia postoperatively with these patients, I have what I call the rule of twos. If the patient develops pneumonia within the first two days after surgery, the prognosis is horrible, I am sorry to say, but death is almost certain. And I'm talking about patients in my hospital with an ICU and the best of the best managing this potential pneumonia. Truthfully, if the pneumonia develops that quickly, that badly, that quickly, odds are there was probably something brewing before the surgery and then the stress of surgery and anesthesia and everything else just turns it into a horrific pneumonic monster. So pneumonia within the first two days post-op, horrible prognosis. Then my next landmark is the two week mark. If they develop pneumonia within two weeks of surgery, prognosis is guarded. So not a guaranteed abysmal prognosis. I'm going to say about a 50-50 chance that they will get over that pneumonia. Usually it's a pneumonia that does require a hospitalization. So it's important that the pet owner be aware and monitor for inappetence, lethargy, cough. Any of those develop, they need to bring the pet back quickly. If they do not develop pneumonia within the first two weeks of surgery, but develop pneumonia within the next two months post-op. They do tend to do overall better with the pneumonia that develops later. They do tend to recover and go on to do well, but it does need to be managed. If they do not develop pneumonia within two months of the surgeries, odds are they will not develop pneumonia. The other complication of total breakdown, that can be devastating because the cartilage that we work with, that gate, the retinoid that we're anchoring open is brittle and can crack and break or the suture material can certainly tear or break. These are all possibilities. I have not seen it frequently. It does happen. Yes, I have seen it. And when we do see it, it is devastating because as that broken cartilage just flaps in the breeze now, uh, it's a lot worse than what it was pre-op. Um, they do need to be seen quickly by the surgeon if that does happen. The way to manage these patients post-operatively or a patient that's not going to have surgery, maybe they are in a position it's been identified, we suspect laryngeal paralysis, surgery is not an option for these pets, what can we do? Exercise needs to be brought down to a level where that pet can tolerate that level of exercise. 
Think of taking the dog for walks in the early mornings or later in the evenings when the sun has gone down or is going down and it is cooler. The pet should stay in air conditioned or at least very cool environment during these hot summer days. Excitement should be avoided. These are the things you know that can help. We want to avoid the situations where the dog needs to pant and breathe faster. Also, let's avoid collars. Let's think of using a harness instead. Uh, let's raise the water and food dishes up so that the head can stay at a steady level. Let's avoid using dog food that is really dusty and dry. So I'm not saying don't use uh, pellets, don't use dog kibbles, but some brands are mo more moist than others naturally. Um, consider using some wet dog food, um, not, not a soupy dog food, but you know, something that's a little bit chunky and wet. And you may want to consider using uh, trazodone, something to take the edge off of this dog to help keep him quiet. Uh, bronchodilators have been used to kind of help that whatever air they are taking in does actually reach the alveoli a little bit better. A uh, bit of a tranquilizer. There is this tracheal elixir that can be available and it's a combination of bronchodilator, um, butorphanol, which can help to sedate the pet a little bit. Um, will tend to reduce a cough, and which may not be the best thing, uh, again, for a potential pneumonia patient because we do want them to cough everything up. So something with a bit of a tranquilizer effect, a bit of a bronchodilator effect, that can be helpful to the pet. I hope you found this information to be helpful. Thank you for being out there and helping the dogs and cats in your community.